Welcome back to the Iconoblast podcast. This is the show that takes a look behind the public facades of famous icons to show you why you can never take anything at face value. My name is Cooper, and sneaking around the table right now is, uh, I think, Joel Benner behind that mask. So what's the deal with the mask again? Or sorry, that's a that's a burqa. Yeah, it's, it's a burqa. Did you convert to Islam? Yes. Well, um, congratulations. Wait, you can't drink in these. I don't think you can drink if you're a Muslim. Really? Yeah. I got no blast. We put the past on blast. Hit them with the truth with things you never knew. Nobody is safe. No thing to place. Got Joel and Coop with history in your face. I got a blast. <laughs> you might want to reconsider the conversion. Oh, okay. Well, I want to drink, so. Yeah. <laughs> So what are we talking about today? Today we're going to be going back to Julius Caesar. And, well, more more specifically, we're going to be talking about the Marian reforms, which didn't happen during Caesar's lifetime, but they were implemented by his uncle Gaius Marius. And uh, they restructured the way the Roman legion worked and sort of paved the way for all the, the things that Caesar was going to do later in his life that turned him into a dictator for life and ultimately got him stabbed to death. Okay. I'm into that. Yeah, let's just jump right into it, because I am really fucking tired right now. We, <laughs> we're recording this a little bit later in the day than I'm used to. I, I'm, in, I'm usually in bed by like 8 p.m. <laughs> you can do it. I can do this. I got this. So I want to take a moment to go back a few years before Caesar and briefly touch on the Marian reforms. They were implemented years before Caesar was born, but they laid the groundwork for his eventual rise to become dictator for life. The Marian reforms were changes to the structure and recruitment process for the Roman military implemented by Caesar's uncle, Gaius Marius, during his first term as consul in 107 BC. Oh, Maid Marian. Yeah, the Maid Marian reforms. That's right. As a direct result of these changes, Rome's military became the largest and most powerful in the Mediterranean. Before the Marian reforms, the Roman military was more of a militia than an army of professional soldiers. Unlike the legion Caesar would lead, pre-Marian reform soldiers were required to be above a certain social class and must own at least 3,500 sesterces worth of property. These requirements assured that the soldiers would be able to afford the cost of being soldiers. So, before the Marian reforms were implemented, Rome didn't have a professional army. They had more of a militia, which meant that citizens of a certain class were required to provide their own weapons and equipment. And any time the state called them to action, they would just have to grab all their gear and go. Wait, so they had to bring their own weapons and guns and ammo? Yeah, well, I mean, not guns and ammo necessarily. They had to bring their own armor. Like swords and... Yeah, well, I I think back then they... No, they were using... Well, you you, you always have your father's sword, right? Like, it gets brought down by generations, so... Like, there's the family armor and the family sword and stuff? Or was that not a thing... I don't know. I, I do know that the soldiers in the Roman legion or the legionnaires would upgrade their own equipment. Like, as they made money as soldiers, they would use that money, at least some of them would use that money to, like, put some bling on their gear. Yeah. Do they have, like, on-site blacksmiths and stuff where, like, you could, like, but you'd have to buy a sword off them? Yeah, well, I'm I'm assuming, yeah, at some point you would have to buy the sword from a blacksmith. But also, as the Legion was on the march, they would bring uh, they would bring blacksmiths along with them to repair gear and sharpen weapons. And take they, whatever they find along the way, too. Yeah, yeah, and you can, I mean, if your buddy dies right next to you and he's got a nice sword, just fucking grab that shit. He's not going to I would take your sword it. if you died. I hope so. I'd get some killed with it. I don't want that to go to waste. Because they... <laughs> It'd uh, be an honor to carry your sword in battle. They would put... Uh, engravings and things like that on the on the scabbards of their swords to make them that much more impressive. If they were making good money off of being a soldier, if they were a shitty soldier, or just because. Uh, Could you imagine if you had to do that now? You're like joining the army, and they're like, "Well, whatever weapon you bring is the one you're going to use. So bring what, whatever you can find." Oh yeah, I'd, <laughs> if that was the case, the the only decent rifle that I've got right now is an old Remington thirty automatic. That's like. Fuck, 120 years old at That'd this point. Sweet, I think though. it was made in 1902. It only holds like four rounds, though. That would be kind of <laughs> shitty. I mean, it's got some stopping power, but you can't buy the ammunition anymore. I'd have to reload it myself in the field. You would still be above all the people that don't even have a gun. So like, some people would be showing up with knives and forks or like a broom, <laughs> whatever they have, you know? I don't know if I've 
I've ever seen anybody fight with a knife and a fork. I mean, I'm sure it's happened, but probably not in the Roman Legion. But well, yeah, maybe the, the people that the Roman Legion were uh, raping and pillaging. You know, like a housewife. But they were they were fighting with knives and forks. Yeah, I don't know if they the even, housewife probably stabbed a, a Roman soldier in the eye with a fork before she went down. I don't think they even had forks back then. I don't think forks were implemented until like. Hundreds, if not what did they have? Thousands of years sporks. later, it was sporks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sporks were invented before the fork. I'm pretty sure, at least somebody can <laughs> fact check me on that. If uh, if if you know the answer to whether or not the spork was invented before the fork, or whether or not the Romans had access to sporks at that time, just email us at iconoblastpodcast.com or iconoblastpodcast at gmail dot com. Wait, so what did they use? Chopsticks. No, I I think all they used was I mean they used their swords. I'm pretty sure that they partially they used daggers, like little. Uh, they were eating like like brave well, like style a, where like they just eat with their belt hands. knife. Yeah, you would eat with your hands, and then if you were eating a a big piece of meat, you would just grab a piece of it and cut, cut it, it off with, with your, your belt knife and put it in your mouth. And I'm pretty sure they had spoons back then. I mean, spoons are pretty low tech, but forks. That's how did they make spoons? Same way they make swords, I would assume. They have little like pre-made little shit and they pour the lava juice in there well they don't they don't even make swords that way you to make a sword you have to take a uh, i've seen conan that's the only get, way well, i know about swords and that's that's very inaccurate for the way they actually make <laughs> swords if you make a sword from a, a cast you're gonna have a pretty shitty sword because you actually want to take the were you they wanna, not casting swords back then i don't i don't think anybody in their right mind has ever really cast a sword and so like, conan's bullshit is what you're saying Parts of it. Fuck. Not all of it. I thought it was a documentary. No, well, it, I mean, it kind of partially was because the Sumerians were a, a real thing, just not exactly the way that Arnold Schwarzenegger portrayed them. Okay, well, let's get back to the Maid Marian reforms. Okay. Then. As I'm sure I will mention many times over the course of this series, currency conversions of ancient Rome don't really work. Different techniques have been used to calculate the equivalent purchasing power in modern denominations, each of which have their shortcomings. Using the modern value of precious metals, a gold sester C would be worth around $3, and a silver sester C would be roughly $2. While it may seem like a solid enough baseline to work from, when you compare that value to labor rates or the average price of commodities, the inaccuracies become clear. In relation to the cost of labor at the time, a sester C had a value of about 50 cents. Whereas, compared to the price of daily commodities like groceries, one sester C would be worth roughly $10. As you can see, the results vary wildly. I've decided to go with what I believe is the most accurate way to determine the value of any currency. How much sex it'll buy. Mm. So, for the benefit of the show, (laughs) I hit the streets to do some investigative reporting. After a week of hard drugs, unprotected sex, and two ironically unplanned trips to Planned Parenthood, (laughs) I believe I now have the most accurate estimate value of Roman currency ever created. This took a lot of work. I bet. And a lot of penicillin. Taking the average cost of Roman prostitutes and comparing it to the amount of money I overdrafted from my bank account, divided by the number of restraining order notices I received, I have determined the sestercy has the equivalent purchasing value of between $15 and $50. Hmm. Not not a super narrow margin, but... Couldn't the the variation in... Couldn't that depend on the area? Kind of like weed, like the... uh the price of a of a gram in one place is fifteen bucks. Somewhere else, it's twenty bucks. If you're in high school, it's thirty bucks. Oh, if like that. For me, know, in high school, it was forty bucks for a gram because you paid forty bucks for a gram of weed. The very first gram that I ever bought, I paid forty dollars nice. for, and it for sure was not a gram. It was probably about less a than half a gram, gram, and it was yeah. probably like. I mean, it was probably fucking oregano shitty. for all I know. <laughs> yeah. Did you when you were a kid? Did you ever smoke? Did you make make your own cigarettes and smoke them. Like with tobacco or with, just no, just shit? With, with whatever random shit. For some reason, when you said oregano, it reminded me of a time. Did I tell this story already? I like don't know. time the spice? No, it, it reminded me of a time. Oh, where because my mom and my grandma smoked cigarettes and I thought they were cool, so I took printer paper. Oh, because they are cool. I took printer paper and went out back with my cousins, and I was like, "Dude, a printer paper, we can get the grass." So we pulled a bunch of grass out the lawn and then went to the park because the park had these uh, uh, like big monster truck tires as what you could climb on. So they made like three stacked up so you could get inside them and hide in there. And we went in there and we rolled fake cigarettes with grass and smoked them. How did that taste? Oh, it was horrible. But we, we pretended the whole time. Like I was trying, I was sucking it down. <laughs> Got grass in my mouth, coughed a shit ton. 
No, the, I was the, high as fuck. The closest thing that I could think of that I did when I was around that age or just when I was younger is I, I grew up in the, out in the middle of nowhere. Like I was a hardcore redneck growing up. Yeah. So what we would do is there was a, there was a certain type of plant that grew around my hometown. I, I don't remember the name of it, but I remember it was a, a fairly hollow reed with some kind of pulpy material on the inside. And we would break that off into a piece that was about as long as a cigarette. And then we would just <laughs> put that in our mouths and smoke it. And I mean, it didn't do anything for you us. You would light we were, it and yeah. try to suck on it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, it worked really well. It, it worked. Did you get fucked up? No. No, I didn't yeah, get anything from it. I mean, you get I think I got dizzy throat. from not being able to breathe from smoking lawn grass. But yeah, well, we weren't even, I mean, from what I recall, we weren't even, like, inhaling that shit. We were just puffing on it because we thought it made us cool. Because, hmm. I mean. Well, you, it did make you cool, just so you know. Well, yeah, obviously. I mean, look where I am today. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for pretending to smoke cigarettes when I was a kid. <laughs> That, fuck, that reminded me of, uh, I'll make it quick. No, no, please, you, please continue. Did you ever play that game? It's like a, uh, there was a name for it, but you, it's like you do whippets, you know? Mm-hmm. But you, it's a race. Do you know about this? Did you do this? No. So what you do is, is you wear your backpack backwards. And then you go into the grocery store and two of you grab whippet cans. And then at the same time. Oh, I know this game. It's called shoplifting. Well, that ha- no, that's a, uh, you want to make an omelet, you have to break some eggs. It's like, oh, okay. That's, you're not trying to shoplift, it just happens. It's a necessary evil because yeah, you're so kids you, and you don't have the money for whipped cream. <laughs> yeah. So you take a you take a big hit off it and then you just start running. And then the person who can run the furthest before they pass out or fall over <laughs> wins. Christ. But you wear, the, you wear your backpack because it breaks your fall. No, I never played that game. There's we- a name for it. <laughs> anyway, I'll remember the name at some point. If you remember it, bring it up again, because I've never heard of that before. Uh, what I makes mean, it, it funny is because you wear your backpack backwards. You can fill it full of pillows if you want, but it's usually just your school shit. Mm-hmm. So that you, I mean, you already look You're stupid. like falling on books and binders and yeah, but it slows pencil your cases fall. and shit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess it's maybe better than falling directly on the ground. kind of pulls you down so you hit your head first, but... I explain some things. No one got hurt. Well, no, you don't no always know. The the, you don't always <laughs> know when you receive a traumatic brain injury. Sometimes <laughs> it sometimes it just feels like a hard bump on the head. So, as I was saying, <laughs> I've determined the Sester C has the equivalent purchasing value of between fifteen and fifty dollars. Oh, okay, that's how we got into that. Okay. Admittedly, the variation in my figures is wider than I initially hoped. This is most likely due to my anachronistic inclusion of the cost of my antibiotics. <laughs> History buffs will, of course, know that neither antibiotics nor syphilis existed in Europe at the time. Antibiotics were discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928, and as we learned in our Columbus series, syphilis was most likely introduced to Europe by the conquistadors in the early 1500s. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that with us. Admittedly, it wasn't really investigative reporting. It was just me going on a bender for a week and doing a bunch of drugs and having sex with a bunch of prostitutes. But it's my first time in Austin, so I I just wanted to cut loose for a little bit. So if you were wondering why I disappeared for the last week, that's what I was up to. (laughs) Wait, there's prostitutes in Austin? Yeah, there's prostitutes. How do you get a hold of them? With COVID and stuff, how do you deal with the COVID shit with masks and stuff? I obviously wasn't even... Worried about using condoms, so why am I going to worry about using a mask? Well, because you could get COVID. <laughs> You've already got everything else. <laughs> Had everything else. I I did a very, very aggressive round of antibiotics to deal with everything else. <laughs> the pre-Marian reform Roman military also utilized different structure and tactics than post-reform. Made Marian. The, sorry, the, the pre-made Marian reform, that's too much of a mouthful, and I've had way more mouthfuls in the last week than I want. <laughs> Prior to the Second Samnite War in 326 BC, the Romans had used a phalanx formation stolen from the Greeks, and the Romans loved to steal from the Greeks. Yes. For those of you with a social life, a phalanx is a formation of troops assembled <laughs> into tightly packed rows. Each man is armed with a shield and a really fucking long spear, which results in a solid wall of wood, metal, leather, and spikes. And it's exactly as erotic as it sounds. Yeah, I'm turned on. Kind of sounds like a Judas Priest concert. At least from my experience. <laughs> I've only been to one. Wow. You went to a Judas Priest concert? Yeah, I saw, well, uh, okay. And admittedly, it wasn't a Judas Priest concert. It was Ozfest in 2000, 2002 or 2003, mm-hmm. and Judas Priest was playing. A riot broke out while Judas Priest was on stage. and it, Because uh, they shred, dude. Oh, fuck, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if 
Uh, I don't know any of their songs. Hellbent for Leather, Breaking oh, the Law. I like that name. Oh, Free Wheel Burning. The okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Judas Priest is the shit. The mass of angry men would march forward in unison, penetrating anything and everything with their long, rock hard spears. And I swear <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking about a Judas Priest concert right now. <laughs> I mean, it would apply to, to Rob Halford to a certain degree. This was bad news for anything unlucky enough to face it head on. Come at it from the sides, though, and it's just a bunch of guys in skirts rubbing up against each other. And once again, <laughs> I am not talking about a Judas, Judas Priest concert. The strength of the phalanx was in its ability to act as a single cohesive unit. Each man was responsible for maintaining their piece of the wall, and if a single brick came loose, the whole structure was at risk of crumbling. The phalanx was great for large-scale battles on wide open fields, but fell short when pitted against highly mobile enemies or rough terrain. Romans were notoriously bad at scouting ahead of their legions, meaning the patient, meaning a patient enemy would just need to lay in wait for the formation to pass and then hit it from the sides. This resulted in the largest and most costly ambush in military history at the Battle of Lake Trisimene in 217 BC. The battle at Lake Trisimene was a goddamn slaughter. It was like 60,000 Roman soldiers mm. were slaughtered. Now, I'm pretty sure it was Hannibal that, that carried that out, and Hannibal was really good at fucking up the Romans. At Hannibal? Least he, the guy that eats people? No, d uh, the cannibal's namesake was, uh, he was a, uh, he was from Carthage, and he just loved to fuck up the Romans. Like, they couldn't beat him. Uh, I mean... He it, had their shit figured out. Yeah, and, yeah, I mean, also, he was just, he was a fucking brilliant tactician. I would, I would love to do a series about Hannibal, because he's probably one of the best military minds in, in history. Uh, but he was beaten by Scipio Africanus. And Scipio Africanus Skippy? is... Skippy? Skippy. Wait, Scipio and Hannibal fucked up the Romans? What the <laughs> hell's going on here? Do no, you make these names up? Scipio was a Roman. Scipio Africanus was a Roman. Uh, okay. he, Scipio was Sk such a... Scipio and, ha and Scipio. Hannibal. Scipio and Hannibal. That sounds like a buddy <laughs> cop movie. But Scipio Africanus was such a good military leader that even like over a hundred years after his death, there was a, I don't know if you would call it a myth or a legend or prophecy or just a saying that a Scipio cannot be beaten in Africa. Cause he was the best. Yeah. In well, but only in Africa. All right, I want to so, know about, I want to know the side story about the romance between Scipio and Hannibal. The Did romance between meet? Scipio and Hannibal. Uh, I mean, they met on the battlefield, but I don't against think... Against each other? Yeah. Yeah, they, they fought the shit out of like each other. Like Romeo and Juliet. And it was uh, Scipio Africanus and Fabius... Fabius Maximus, I think his name was. I, I'm probably wrong. Oh, the guy from Gladiator. No, that was Maximus Decimus Meridius. Oh. Triplex Aces was the name of the formation adopted to fix the shortcomings of the phalanx. Now, before oh, anybody... Oh, because of, because of Scipio, they had to read... No, because of Hannibal, they had to fix their shit. No, it was because of the the Samnite War. Uh, the when they sixty thousand people died. Oh, I thought you were no saying. that that was the uh, that was the ambush at Lake Trisimene that that happened. That in wasn't Hannibal. Two seventeen BC. That that happened about a hundred and ten years before the Marian reforms. It wasn't uh, well. Hannibal was the one that was responsible for the ambush at Lake Trisimene, but the Samnite War had nothing to do with Hannibal. Hannibal was long dead mm. at that point, so it was like over a okay. hundred years later. So it took him a hundred years to learn their lesson. And change up their tactics. Some, well, I mean, because frankly, of Caesar's it was, uncle, it was still working at that point. Uh, I mean, it Just worked one for big fuck up. One really big fuck up, and the the big fuck up was primarily because of the the egos of the two consuls that were running the the legion that got ambushed at Lake Trisimene, mm, and also consuls. because the the holding feces, holding feces. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. if if yeah, you want to know remember. what Joel's talking about with holding feces, go back to the earlier Rome episodes, and we would really get into it then. Yeah, well, you if you do listen to the ones before, you can learn how they ran their government. Yeah, without, yeah, which I but you'll have actually, to deal with me being annoying at the same time. Well, I mean, <laughs> if they're a fan of the show, then that then they're going to be kind of kind of yeah. how the show goes. <laughs> <laughs> so, before anybody corrects me on the pronunciation of triplex aces, I know that some people pronounce it triplex axes or triplex achius. I've heard it pronounced a bunch of different ways by a bunch of different people. I have no fucking idea. It's a lot easier to say triplex aces, so just deal with it. Triplex aces was the, name, was the name of a formation adopted to fix the shortcomings of the phalanx. The men were divided into groups called maniples, consisting of 120 men that would be divided into three ranks of 40 when in combat. And this is actually a, a pretty genius system that 
it continued after the Marian reforms, but the the Marian Maid, reforms, Maid Marian. yeah, after the Maid Marian reforms, but it <laughs> uh, the Marian reforms really just kind of expanded the pool of recruits that they were able to pull from, and they sort of normalized the equipment for all of the soldiers, so they didn't have multiple different types of soldiers. The maniples were arrayed in a checkerboard pattern called a quincux, which is another thing that's, yeah, it's hard to pronounce. It's spelled C-U, or sorry, Q-U-I-N-C-U-N-X. Good luck pronouncing that. Queen Cook. Yeah, it's named after the pattern on dice. The space between the maniples increased the mobility of the entire formation by giving it space to contract and leaving openings to move other maniples forward or backward as needed. So it was set up like a, a checkerboard where there was uh, there were these individual maniples all spaced out, mm. and that would allow the entire formation to contract or expand as needed to get around different uh, enemies, uh, obstacles rocks, in the terrain. buildings. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it Starbucks. also oh yeah, because those, those things are fucking many, everywhere. They're how many? Every goddamn uh, corner. How many were in a checkerboard? Like, each square, did that change depending on how many troops they had? or No, that was pretty standardized. It changed later in the post-Marian Reform Legion, but pre-Marian Reform Legion, Marian. there was pre-made Marian Reform Legion, <laughs> was uh, 120 men per maniple. And there were, if I remember correctly off the top of my head, there were two centuries per maniple, and uh, each century was led by a centurion, but the maniple on the right, or sorry, the, the century on the right of the maniple, the centurion leading that century would be in charge or the the boss of the maniple on the left also. There would be a centurion running the, or sorry, the, the century on the left. So there would be a centurion in charge of, of each century in the maniple, two centuries per maniple. Okay. But the century on the right, the centurion leading that one, would be in charge of the centurion on the left. On the other square? No, so each each maniple consisted of two centuries. Yeah, so each two centuries cent- and then the main, main guy. Uh, each century is run by a centurion. And then the centurion leading the century on the right... Is in charge of the centurion on the left. Yes, Okay. Yeah, he's like the the so leader the guy on the of the right. Leader, the main. Yeah, he's that's the, the one the you want to hit with the arrow. Uh, this is something that I actually thought was kind of interesting. Is uh, the term sinister and dexterous comes from the Latin word for left? Sinister is uh, I don't remember the actual Latin term for it, but sinister is left and dexterous is right. Hmm. Which I thought was kind of interesting because we've changed sinister to have the meaning of being evil. Yeah. But it uh, originally just meant left. Left. That's interesting because in film, moving right to left makes you subconsciously think bad. That's right. I remember you telling me about that. And then subconsciously, if, if something's moving left to right, it makes you think something good is happening. So that's weird. If you're left handed, you're an evil person. I mean, that's got to yeah. be what it is. Hitler was left-handed. Was he? Yeah. Sure, dude. I know a lot about history. Yeah. Yeah, we'll just go with that. <laughs> the maniples at the front of the formation were occupied by young, generally poor men called the Hastati. These soldiers were initially equipped with the spear as their primary means of poking holes in other people, but this was later replaced with the more iconic Gladius short sword. They... Uh, even when they were using spears, they still had uh, either a gladius or some other form of, of short sword that they would carry just in case they, they got their primary spear taken away from them. Mm. Or uh, I think back when they were still, when the Hastati were still carrying spears, when they were more of a, similar to the hoplites from, from the Greek phalanxes or the Greek or Macedonian phalanxes. Uh, Wait, wh- who are those again? The Greeks. No, the hop, hoplites. Uh, hoplites, or uh, sometimes they're, uh, people pronounce it as hoplite. They were the like the the primary soldiers of the the Greek and Macedonian armies that made up the phalanx. Okay. Because the Romans stole the phalanx from the Greeks. The Romans stole a lot of shit from the Greeks. I mean, the the Romans stole Greece pretty much. They well, subjugated Greece. This is a little off topic, but I was trying to look up if Hitler had was left handed, and 
It's not confirmed that he is yet. But apparently he had Parkinson's. Really? And he was hiding it, but his left hand was always shaky. I heard he had syphilis also, I think. But it's not true that Hitler only had one ball. He actually had three testicles. The Hastati carried a large square shield called a scutum. The scutum was made from multiple layers of wood glued together and wrapped with leather and canvas. Weighing 22 pounds or 10 kilogram, Hastati used their scutum to deflect incoming attacks as well as crush stalls. Scutum. Scutum. Again, I've heard that pronounced scutum or scutum. scutum. I'm just, I'm just going to go with scutum because scutum I'm afraid if I say... Scutum kind of sounds like slang for like butt something, right? See, I... I was going with scutum instead of scutum because I thought if I went with scutum, you were gonna you were like gonna scrotum? inflate that with scrotum. Well, exactly. scutum made me think of like a dog scooting its <laughs> little butt across the carpet, leaving stains. Okay, no matter what I say, you're just gonna turn it into a goddamn joke. <laughs> you're gonna love this next entry. Roman soldiers loved their scutum, and it would continue <laughs> to be used in the legions until well after the manipular system was abandoned. Troops under Caesar himself used them to great effect in all of his battles. Gaius Suetonius Tranquillus, author of the Twelve Caesars, gave two accounts of a soldier named Cassius Scava and his buddy Gaius Achilles, saving the day with nothing but their massive scutum. Or scutum, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> Sweet. At the Battle of Dyrrhachium during a later civil war, Cassius Scava, quote, with one eye gone, his thigh and shoulder wounded, and his shield bore through by arrows in 120 places, continued to the guard the gates of the fortress put in his charge. So this guy was just standing there taking arrow after arrow into oh, this giant right. shield and just standing his ground. It's like uh, like Jet Li in that, that movie. What was it called? Legend? What? Uh, uh, Fist of Legend? No, not Fist of Legend. That's my favorite Jet Li movie. I don't think it was Fist of Legend. What happens in it? Uh, at the very end, he gets killed by a rain of arrows, and it's just kind of cool because it, it shows the ground behind him, and it's just like everything is filled with arrows except this human shape. Wait, I haven't seen that. Really? What movie is that? It came out like right right before or right after uh, House of Flying Daggers when everybody was all gung-ho about uh, 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 Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon came out and within the next few years there was a bunch of movies that kind of cashed in on Americans loving that type of shit. Hmm. At the Battle of Massilia, Gaius Achilles, quote, grasped the stern of one of the enemy ships and when his right hand was lopped off, boarded the ship and drove the enemies before him with the boss of his shield. Bad so ass. this fucking guy, yeah, he gets his arm cut off, or he gets his hand cut off, so it cuts off his right hand. All he has left is he's he's got his giant scutum, or scutum in his left hand. <laughs> and since Good. that's all he has, he he doesn't give up. He just puts it in front of him and shield rushes those motherfuckers. The second line of maniples were filled with the meat and potatoes of the pre-Marian reform legions, the principes. These were the main line heavy infantry of the Roman army. They were better equipped, had more experience, and got to hang back until the rookies wore out the enemy before closing in and finishing the fight. The pre-Marian Reform Legion, they they did rotate their troops in and out, but they sort of had an order of battle that, that they would generally go by where the Hastati would go in first, fuck things up for a little while, uh, wear down the enemy, and then the Principes were meant to go in and just end the fight. Okay. Um, but if the Principes started getting worn out, then they would swap out again with the with the Hastati. And then once the Hastati got worn out, the Principes would, would move in again. Generally, it didn't take that long because the Romans were really fucking good at, at fighting. Yeah, I looked up scutum definition. It means, uh, it means careless or disorderly. Or... Really? Shield. Those are two wildly different definitions. Yeah, but there's some cool pictures of their giant shields right here. I'm yeah, at. their shields looked awesome. They're, they're, anybody who's seen any movie about the the Romans, I mean, even in, in Gladiator, they were using Scutum, uh, like during the, the every fucking battle that they fought in Gladiator, there was somebody carrying a Scutum. Oh. Now you're just looking at pictures of Scrotums. <laughs> no, uh, Scutum, I think it comes from bugs, like... Uh, Really? Yeah, it comes from like ar- bugs that have giant armor. They called those scutums, according to National Geographic here. The term scutum derives from the Latin word for shield. The scutum in the ear is a sharp, bony spur formed by the superior wall of an external auditory canal. 
Yeah, I'd never heard that before. In the lateral wall of the tympanic cavity. Ah, uh, yes, the tympanic cavity. We all know about that. Yeah, we we don't need to get into that. We're just going to be boring people because everybody knows about that. Wait, the Romans stopped using the scrotum? Scotum? Well, I mean, eventually. Oh, because they got machine guns. Yeah, yeah, pretty <laughs> much. So uh, I I think that they they kept using it until the fall of the empire. Yeah, like the the ancient Roman Empire, the uh, Republic of Rome, that I was around for like four or five thousand years. Maybe not that long. I don't know. The last line of the formation was filled with the grizzled, cranky badasses known as the Triarii. Ah, these guys. These guys were a living wall that nothing crossed, friend or foe. The Triarii strongly discouraged the soldiers in front of them from running away by being more intimidating than the enemy. Yeah, the Triarii were fucking badasses. If one of the rookies lost their nerve and broke formation, they would walk right into a wall of spears held by the toughest and most loyal soldiers the Legion had to offer. The Triarii strongly discouraged the soldiers in front of them from running away by being more intimidating than the enemy. If one of the rookies lost their nerve and broke formation, they would walk right into a wall of spears held by the toughest and most loyal soldiers the Legion had to offer. Fuck yeah. The Triarii were the only to remain using spears after the Hastati and Principes switched to the Gladius. If everything went to hell in a handbasket, they came in to rescue the youngsters and mop up the rest of the bad guys. The Triarii were so good at finishing fights, they inspired a popular Roman saying, It has come down to the Triarii. This meant that the boys had failed, and now it was up to the men to save the day. <laughs> these, are, these are the expendables of the Romans. Yeah, the expendables of the it's Roman It's all the Legion. old bucks that still fuck shit up. And they were the only soldiers, uh, I, I believe they were the only soldiers to continue using something similar to phalanx tactics mm. once the manipular system was implemented. When they switched from the phalanx to maniples, the triarii were the, the remnants of the phalanx. So they were just this shield wall of grizzled badasses holding these I giant like spears. It's like all who, all the toughest characters you've seen in any war movie, the old guys in, in like movies that are based in this time period with eye patches and scars and glass eyes and fucking that are buff but kind of fat. Like exactly. That's these guys. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. The the Triarii for sure had missing bugs. fingers, missing eyes, maybe I mean, missing scars all over the place. These are a, maybe a peg leg. To, I mean, maybe I, uh, I don't know if they. I'm sure that they had some sort of prosthetics back then. They would. It would be something weird because people are for sure losing limbs. They must replace it with something. If you lose a yeah, like that dude that leg. got his hand chopped off and then took over the ship with a shield. Oh, they gave him a hook for sure. A hook or or something. Yeah. When the first two lines broke, the Triarii would form a shield wall. They would then plant the bases of their spears in the ground, point the business end at the bad guys, and cover the retreat of the rest of the men. The Triarii would stand their ground and fight until one side was left standing. There's famous that accounts is. of of the, the rest of a Roman legion retreating from a battle and the Triarii standing behind, staying behind to hold the line while everybody else gets away, and they... They just won't fucking move. Once they plant their Either spears... They, they die or they win. Yeah, they either die or they they kill everybody else or they scare everybody else off. And, and they're all they, fucked up at the dick. by that point. They're crazy, right? So they would prefer to die before they would run. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the... the <laughs> uh, Actually, the this this next paragraph actually uh, talks about it, about Hell that yeah. a little bit. As a third line of the triplex ACs, shit really had to hit the fan before the Triarii got their hands dirty. This led to a lot of sitting around, all dressed up with no one to kill. <laughs> the Triarii sometimes made a fuss about not getting any blood on their hands, so generals were occasionally forced to send them into battle. Oh, they would, shit. They would get they're, so... they're so far in the back that sometimes they wouldn't get to fight. Most of the time, if, if things were going well, the Triarii would never fight. And so they would start getting frustrated. They would get pissed Fuck. off because it's like... Dude, we're we're the baddest fucking soldiers that you have. That's so crazy. How and do you, we're just how are sitting you here in the back. <laughs> and to get to that point, to actually become a Triarii, you didn't just have to be an old man. You had to be a veteran. You've been through multiple battles. You yeah. are the best of the best in the Roman Legion. You're the toughest that they have to offer. You worked, you worked your way up the ranks, and now you're the G. But even the Gs back then, like, what is the mindset where, like, I feel like nowadays... If there's battles and things were going well and you were the Triaria, you'd be like, I'm good. I only want to fight if I if I have to. 
But these fuckers were like pissed off when they didn't get to fight. That's yeah, like the mentality that that you had to be in. And how many of them are there? Like hundreds? No, fifty. Uh, like like that's like, something. It's a gangster crew, right? Something else that's crazy about it is they were uh, the Triarii were at half strength compared to the other maniples. So they were stretched out thin to cover all the ranks. And so a uh, uh, regular maniple, or sorry, the uh, each. Uh, each line would have about 120 men, or no, not 120 men. Uh, each line would have about 1,200 men in it. There, so there's 1,200 Hastati, 1,200 Principes. There's only 600 Triarii, because that's all they needed. And if you need more than 600 Triarii, that's you're a fight fucked. that you're not going to win. Yeah. But, frankly, there's not many fights that 600 Triarii can't win. Yeah. Fuck, that's crazy, dude. I love these guys. They were... They were so fucking badass. I, I mean, to in a culture that was as warlike as the the old school Roman legion, yeah. to be such badasses that they have a saying named after you or a, a oh, saying yeah. what that was, was inspired saying? by you, what it is it has come down to the triarii, or it has come to the triarii. Fuck, that's sweet. So they that's were sort of like so uh, they were sort of like the the special forces. Uh, well, no, not special forces because they they didn't really get sent in. They were. They were just the last line of defense. They were a, a living, breathing wall. Yeah. And if uh, so, the well, they would they would also assault at times, right? If they bitched enough. So they the, probably didn't bitch. They sound so oh, no. badass where they would just no, be they, like, "Hey, we're going in. Fuck what he says. We're just gonna march in and get some kills." Really, it was it was more like the 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 centurion of the triarii would just go to the general and be like, yeah. "Hey, look." You either send us in to fight them, or we're just going to start fighting everybody around <laughs> yeah. us. We want to we want to fuck somebody up. Yeah, it, it, he wouldn't even have to say that. He would just start walking towards the general. <laughs> the general and be like, then he'd look okay, over and be go, like, go. "I already, I, I already know. I understand. Okay, okay. I understand. Yeah, it's been three battles. Okay." So the way the the regular order of battle would go, since the the triplex ACs was broken up into three lines, where you know Hastati, Principes, Triarii. Oh, the way it was supposed to work. Have is, we broken this down yet? Uh, yeah, I mean, we broke it down over the course of the episode. We haven't gotten to like the equites and velites, but we're going to do that in the next episode. Okay. Because uh, yeah, there's there's two additional. That sounds complicated. I feel like we need to break that down at, at some point, like because that's each row, right? Yeah. So, uh, and it even stuck around to. Kind of stuck around post Marian reform. Post Marian reform, they condensed all the the unit types, uh, or at least all the the melee units down into a single type, which was just a, a legionnaire, and a legionnaire was closer to a uh, principe in the, okay. the pre-Marian reform. So the way the order of battle was supposed to go was the Hastati, which were the, the youngest and poorest and least experienced soldiers, would be out in front. They have lighter armor or just shittier armor because they can't afford anything better because this is still a militia at the point. Everybody has to supply their own equipment. Oh, okay, we're still there. Yeah, so they, they're they not very old, they're not very experienced, and they haven't earned enough money to buy themselves like some really sick-ass yeah, gear they're that out they've there tripped and like, out over the years. They like killed their horse before they left and made like a leather fucking dick pad out of it. Well, if they had a horse, they would have been an equity because it was, uh, the, that was, that was money back then. Yeah. You had to have a lot of land and you had to have a lot of money to raise horses. So it was actually like retarded donkey and then made a, (laughs) made a, made a cod piece out of that and shoulder pads out of a couple of rabbits, rabbit shoulder pads and like a, like a squirrel necklace. (laughs) They're out there on the front lines. So the Velites, uh, we'll talk about the Velites in the next episode, but the Velites were actually required to wear animal skins. Usually, uh, most commonly, they would wear a wolf skin with the the wolf skull on their head. That's sweet. And they were like the the lowest ranking members of the the pre-Marian Reform Legion. They were the ones that would actually get sent in before the Hastati. Uh, but they weren't okay. they weren't mainline troops. They they weren't supposed to make contact with the enemy. They were skirmishers. They would kind of kick up a uh, what's a, skirm? Oh, like a like, like they, shit talkers. Yeah, yeah, they'd go in. They'd talk shit. They'd throw spears. Uh, they try to call other people out into one on one combat. 
Uh, they're like the hype, the hype men. They're the the hype men. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, They would hype everybody (laughs) up and they would, they would screen the main formation while everybody else got in, got in line because it's similar to the way football's played where you don't want the other team to see exactly how your troops are laid out right right away so they can counter your formation. You want to have your formation surprise them. Okay. So they would go out there and like, they're like a, a, they're basically the very first flashbang grenade yeah yeah Yeah. actually similar to that they (laughs) they were a a shock and awe type of element they they run around out there throw shit fucking they were noisy they uh, kick up dust make a cloud so they can't see what's going on behind them yeah and the the cool the legion required them to wear the wolf skins or just animal skins in general because the officers wanted to be able to pick them out of a group easily because they knew that these were just some fucking kids. So right. it's like they didn't want them sneaking into the main line or anything like that. They wanted to be able to to keep track of all these youngsters running around fucking shit up. With their wolf heads on their heads. Yeah. Yeah. So they made them wear animal skin so they could be picked out from so, the So the then when the troops. war actually, or the war, but like if a battle actually happened, they would fall back between the ranks, like fall into the checkerboard or like run out the sides. Yeah. That was one of the benefits of. Uh, so they, they didn't have to like it. Maybe they probably. They, I mean, they had to have fought here and there, but like that yeah. wasn't their main goal. Like if the shit hit the fan, they were allowed to run away. Oh, they, yeah, they were supposed to. Uh, okay. The the velites were never meant to actually form a line and fight because I, as far as I can tell, they they didn't even really carry shields. They would carry seven pila or pilum, uh, seven that? spears, throwing oh. spears, uh, also called darts. Sometimes they they were just short spears. Seven of them. Uh, yeah, they would carry uh, between five and Short, seven of them, depending on your spears. That makes sense because you'd be pissing people off. Yeah, you uh, they would they would run in very I think I'd be really chaotic patterns, that. and oh, you would make a great velite. I'd spread my butt. I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd I'd shit on the field. I'd do anything see, to piss them off because if your goal like that, is to fuck them up, exactly. You're yeah. you're fucking with the enemy's head. You're getting them all riled up, and if you piss them off bad enough, they're going to make a mistake. Because if if you can actually make them so angry that some of them break formation and run out, then you and your boys are just going to jump on them and, yeah. and kill them all. You got and that's yeah. going to fuck with the enemy's head even more. Totally, I get that. That's a great idea. That's, who, and who and who came up with that? Was uh, that just always part of their that shit? No, it was that was implemented. Uh, uh, no, that oh, uh, this is still before we haven't even gotten. This is still before the Marian. Yeah, this is Marian this is all pre-Marian reform. The post-Marian reform, they replaced the velites with uh, auxiliaries, and the auxiliaries were similar to the velites, but it was like a more standardized way of of doing things. They went mainstream. It went. Yeah, they it was just like indie an indie action movie. But now it's like a Marvel movie. As soon as they got popular, fucking, they just went mainstream <laughs> and everything sucked. That took all the soul out of it. What are they, what are they called? The Velites? Velites. Fucking badasses. So the Velites would go out there and taunt the enemy. You uh, can talk all the shit you want and then you just get to That split. was your job, yeah. And yeah. so after uh, either you would... But they would get kills, right? Because they're also trying to prove themselves. Yeah, they would... Uh, well, according to some sources, uh, it's not completely confirmed but according to some sources the velites would challenge individual enemies to one-on-one combat and like try to get one person to come out and face them one-on-one in front of the rest of the legion so if they fuck up that one person out in front of the rest of the legion that's going to boost the morale of your team because they're going to see like you know one of your boys going out there and and fucking up 13 year old kid just whooped someone's ass yeah yeah then then you're going to be stoked was that how old they were were they that young no they were they were no they were most likely older than that because the uh, the, What's the average age? Do you know, like, the average age of a... I would imagine that they started somewhere around, like, 16, 17. You think he was like that, that late? Cause well, yeah, because they... Wasn't everything younger back then? No, they want people that are strong. The The Legion was actually... Pre-Marian hmm. reform and post-Marian reform, they were actually fairly particular about... Well, pre-Marian reform, they were a little bit less particular because they didn't have a standing army. It was, it was just a militia. But post-Marian reform especially... They were very particular about the sto- the soldiers that they would select. They had a four month long training process post Marian reform. They had a four month long training process just to become a member of the the legion. You had to okay train twice a day. Like it was a a brutal, very difficult training process uh, that you had to go through to actually become a full fledged member of the legion. But that wasn't until after the reform. That was after before the reform. You still need to be like 
the head I mean, of your household. Like you need to be an adult at their tents and shit, and they're like they're doing some training. And they would do drills together. Also, like they would have to to do military drills together just so everybody can move as a to. cohesive unit. Yeah, yeah. You'd like want to like I'm gonna get killed if I don't learn this shit. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, the it was just a. A requirement. It, it, since it was a militia, anytime the state called you to go and fight, <laughs> Dude. you just had to fucking do it. So if yeah. they called you to go and train, you had to fucking do it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if you don't, just they're just going to come about, and kill like, you. The poor guy that just enough money to get in, you know, like before the pre before the reforms, like just enough money to get in, and you're like all excited because you're a fucking idiot, and you're like, Dad, I got in. <laughs> Just and you like you're the only one with like a, a wooden stick, and everyone else has the swords, you know, or like you have a really dull, shitty, well, Conan sword. Apparently, that's why before. Oh yeah, and Conan sword. The way that that it's forged in the movie, it, off topic, but yeah, the way that Conan sword is own, forged in the movie. You don't know their techniques. I mean, uh, okay, well, we'll do a test. You can melt down some. Some iron or whatever the fuck they have. What were they melting? Pour it into a mold. I mean, I'm, back then, if it was if it was when the Sumerians were still around, that's like that's like pre Rome. It was like a really old culture. <laughs> so yeah, they. I mean, that was like bronze age. Wait, how did they make swords then? Uh, you take an ingot and you have to you What's have an to ingot? heat it up, a chunk of metal. You you so form you, it from a solid piece a, of metal. Where did they you so you would mine a giant piece of metal? Yeah, and then you would smelt it. And there's a bunch of different ways to smelt the material to And what does that mean? You you grab a bunch of you grab a bunch of ore or rocks that have iron or uh you know, this some sort of metal like deposit. The stuff in that would make a good sword. Yeah. Well, so I mean, you heat it up and like shape it. Like how you? Uh, well, I mean, the smelting process. And I mean, don't don't quote me on this because I'm not a metallurgist. But you melt down ore that has some sort of metal in it, and then you go through some steps to remove the impurities from the metal. So you're left with like, just like hammering iron. and flipping and hammering and flipping. Uh, well, and the the process of melting it down and adding different. I thought um, that's what they were doing in Conan. Oh, no, but you don't you don't cast a sword. You you forge a sword. You don't cast it. Okay. He they just I know that like that you don't you don't John just John Milius knew that. I know he did. The dude's obsessed with history. Oh, yeah, but, but it's he not, just knew it looked so fucking cool the shape of a sword in lava. That yeah, must have I mean, been, the, he must have sat the there. The molten metal pouring into a uh Okay. But he knew. There's no way he didn't. I think he just knew it looked cool, and well, nobody would care. I mean, honestly, I I didn't know about that until a handful of years ago. It's not something that you just kind of intuitively look up. Yeah. So so they. Would, I mean, if you see it in so Conan, you're gonna you heat up, you're gonna you, assume it's real. I guess I just have to look this up on my own, like how you actually make swords for real. So yeah, what what you do is you you go through the process of smelting to to get a chunk of metal, whatever that metal is, depending on the era that you're working in. It's either going to be Copper, bronze, iron, yeah. steel. You take that that metal ingot, and then you heat it up, and you just start fucking wailing on it with a hammer, and flattening it out. Till and it becomes... you flatten it out. Well, you you need to fold it too. And the process of folding it makes it stronger. It uh, like heating it and cooling it, and heating it and cooling it. Is that? What uh, well, that's called uh, not quenching. This is I don't a, know, it's, this is it's been a while of, since I looked all of this here. stuff up. Yeah, we're out of our league. Uh, I actually there there was a period of time where I I got like super into researching the process of actually making swords and knives and things yeah, like that. Of course you would. And yeah, I, I go through phases where I get intro. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's where this podcast came from. So yeah. I just go through phases where I get really interested in a specific subject <laughs> and I research the shit out of it and then I lose interest and I forget everything that I learned about it. And now I'm trying to talk about something that, that I already went through that process with. <laughs> um, so yeah, you start with a single chunk of metal, you heat it up, Pound it out. Yeah. Well, you start with a mountain. Pound it out. Well, yeah, you start with a mountain. Start with a mountain, cut out a chunk of metal, heat it up, hammer the fuck out of it, fold it, whatever that means, keep hammering it. I mean, you you pound it out into, like, a a longer shape. I mean, it's it's actually pretty similar to, to making pasta or bread or something like that, where you have to continually develop the gluten but it's the metal version of that you're like okay. realigning the matrices of the of the atoms in the metal to the make matrix. it stronger and, yeah. and more per, more pure and then you just pound it into the shape of a sword i should have probably already looked up a youtube video about how that works but yeah 
whatever. I mean, we're we're towards the end of the episode. It doesn't yeah. matter. What were we even talking about before we got okay, into Okay, so it's the uh, the the oh the the order of battle for the, for yeah, the so Primarian Reform Roman Legion. So you yeah. have what we've covered so far is frontline troops of the Hastati. They go Hastati. in first, and then and the they far make back. first contact with the enemy. Once the Hastati get tired, they swap out with the Principes. The Prince. Principes move in. They have okay. We haven't talked about that yet. Yeah, we did. We did. Yeah, I was looking up Hitler stuff. I think. Uh, yeah, most likely. I mean, that's that's the reason you're always, always distracted. I, you're always yeah. fucking looking up Hitler. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> so, Estadi go in first, wear out the enemy. Principes go in second, and ideally, if the battle is going really well, either the Principes break the enemy and and scatter them because the these these ancient battles the the old school melee combat the yeah. body count could be high but during the actual confrontation there wasn't a whole lot of killing going on it was a lot of intimidation a lot of pushing a lot of yelling i mean there was there was for sure people dying but the vast majority of casualties come from the route once one side breaks and starts running away then the winning side just runs them down and and kills them so the goal Crazy. wasn't to kill everybody on the on the enemy team. It was to break the enemy line so they run away. And then once they're running away, that's when you go and kill them. So ideally, the way the order of battle would go is the Principes should be the ones to finish the fight. They're the ones that once the enemy's worn out by the Hastati, the Principes go in and I'm use their up. superior equipment and experience to, to break the enemy line. If that doesn't break the enemy line, then... Uh, and like I said, this is ideal situation. Then the triarii go in and finish, finish everything off. off. But <clears throat> if it's a very long pitched battle where both sides are equal in strength, equal in numbers, somewhat equal in skill, then the Hastati and the Principes would trade back and forth until the enemy was worn down enough that they either That's broke so or fucking got, smart, got overrun. The Romans were the first ones to do this. And that's why they were so powerful is because they would rotate their troops in and out. They didn't have to worry about their units getting tired because they would just swap them out with the, the line behind them. Yeah. So the line and behind so them they, would um, get to rest. When you're behind the line, you still kind of have to pay attention, right? Like, what is the, uh, what's the technique? Like, if, let's say that four spears come out and drop four people on the line, is does the back line move in or does the line close in? So that would be the, the next line behind moves up from from front to back until you run out of people so the, behind you the, but at that point are they you're the already in a lot of trouble. In the, in uh, the so the has, so let's say the hastati are engaging the enemy yeah. you've got your front line of but hastati not, they don't make a line right uh, well it's it's not exactly a line they're fighting in this checkerboard pattern so there's actually according to some sources there's actually gaps in between each maniple but the front there's there's a wall right it depends on the source some sort because uh, uh, it, oh, according so to this some is up sources, for debate. There's, it's yeah, up for this debate is, if they stay in the checkerboard. Yeah, because what? Yeah, but, see, it actually does make sense staying in the checkerboard pattern because that that was something I was confused about too. Uh, but it does make sense having them in the checkerboard pattern even during combat because if the enemy does try to move in through those gaps in between the maniples, they're, they're surrounded. They're yeah, they're getting themselves surrounded and they're opening themselves up. For attack from the from the sides, the next line, they're they're allowing themselves to be flanked at that point. So e even if they try to flank the the maniples in front, they're just opening up their sides their sides to the maniples behind that. Yeah. So the toughest job would be the cornerman, the guy working the corner of the of the of the square, because you or it or it might be the the easiest because nobody wants no way, to go in there and, and yeah, but open you, up their if sides. If they do move in. And there's still somebody on the front. You're being attacked from two angles. True. So maybe the guy. I wonder if, if the guy on the corner just has two has shields. Two shields. And he like <laughs> pops his head up and then ducks, opens the look and closes. There were uh, there were some old formations. I don't think the Roman Legion used this, but there were some old formations where the front line, uh, like the the exterior line of men would only have shields. They would just have big shields yeah. that they would hold up and Wasn't then the lines like behind would have spears. They the people well, I mean, they all had spears, but like the 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 Spartans in the front, right behind them was another Spartan and they would be stabbing like over oh, yeah. the, over the top. 
yeah, their even long ass uh, beers. even with the manipular system, they the lines behind the front line, they're going to be sitting there poking their spears over the over the tops of their buddies' heads. Okay, um, and something. So when they're rotating to rest, are they really rest? They're I guess having to focus and stare and always be blocking and stabbing is more difficult than like watching from the back. You have a little little sippy of some rum and then do a little <laughs> stab and then have another little sippy and then. I don't know if they were drinking rum. I think that came later, but uh, I mean, what they, were they definitely. What had, were they drinking on? You know, probably wine, or something like that. Well, I mean, most likely during a battle, water, because everybody's well, just water, super dehydrated. No, they were drinking for sure. There's well, yeah, there's always no gonna fucking be doubt. Around. A little bit of something to loosen up. Yes, yeah, if you're going to go in and face a bunch of galls, you know, you take care of the nerves. Yeah, not you, too much, just enough. You want to get that nice point zero five percent blood alcohol. Level. Yeah, you want that like the the perfect amount where you're sober enough to get have a good kill death ratio but but you know not too <laughs> drunk where you get killed before you get your kills where you're you're courageous but you're not sloppy yeah that's that's kind of where you want to be yeah Act, yeah like the drunken master yeah that's what you know the drunken master movie with well i uh, think the drunken master like he was fucking hammered well no but if you watch the movie he learns his lesson he goes too far oh he gets way too drunk it's been a long and, time since I've he, seen that one. And he gets beat up, and it fucks him up. He loses his life, his family, everything, and then he finds the good middle ground. But his middle ground is a lot. It's a lot higher I think than most people's in reality, middle ground. Yeah. In reality, you want to have that buzz, but not drunk, wherever that is. For Confident, you. but not stupid. Yeah. For yeah, the drunken master, it's there. like drunk, but not wasted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so in terms of how they would swap out the troops... Uh, you've got the maniples that the maniples are 120 men all lined up in ranks. Mm-hmm. So if somebody from the front line goes down, the person directly behind them steps up to to fill the gap. Okay, uh, and they're still they're probably in the same rank, right? Like so, each row is it like each row has multiple people for that to happen? Yeah. So the they, second someone falls, there's someone there instantly. Yeah, there's the somebody that, ready that to step went up. Through, what are they called? The wolf head guys? The velites? Yeah. So when the velites fall back. They're not right behind anymore. No, right? the they're uh, once, okay. The Velites are out of it. It's the well, it's actually, the once in the in the uh, yeah. Prince once Prince yeah. once the I'm so bad with names. Once the Velites fall back, they they fall back in between the maniples because there there are these gaps in between the in the man uh, in between the maniples. So the Velites would fall back between those gaps, and then they would actually stay on the back line, and they would become support troops where they would help drag wounded soldiers back. Oh uh, and, shit! They become medics. Like that. So yeah, they. Not necessarily medics, just more like let's get these bodies out of the way so we can keep so fighting. So we can keep fighting. Yeah. Fuck that's. But even that is smart back then. Oh yeah, dude. The, the other th- army probably just stepping on bodies and t- tripping over themselves because they don't have that that I, process. I out. think the I think the Roman legion has like the highest win to loss ratio of, of any. It's all these military. little things, right? Like yeah, because they 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 were brilliant of them tacticians. First. Now everybody thinks of that stuff because we all learned from them. Yeah. But at the time, no one had figured that shit out. That's so cool. Fuck, that's crazy. Yeah, because the the way all of the other militaries were doing it at the time is they would mass up all of their troops in a line, and then everybody would just give 100% for as long as they can until they until got they tired. Until they died. Fuck. Until they died or until they got tired. And then once you get tired, you're too tired to fight. You get stabbed people in the start, neck. People start dying around you. And I think you only need to, you only need to kill like 5% of of the overall enemy force before it'll cause a rout where if they you get see, scared, they start falling yeah, back. They, they see enough of their friends dying around them that they're like, wait, fuck this. We're losing. We're out of here. Yeah. You, and there's a really good example of that in the uh, opening battle of uh, starship troopers. <laughs> <laughs> Textbook example. Yeah. Cause they, they only one dude gets his leg chopped off and they all fucking scream and start running and then they get killed and then they all retreat. Well, I mean really the battle of Clendathu was a, a slaughter from start to finish. There was a lot of deaths there. They lost way more than 5% of their troops. I, That's I, true, but if they would have stuck it up and formed a line and rotated out their troops like they, they learned from the Romans, everybody. well, they, no, they would have got them. They weren't losing because they were tired. They were losing because somebody made a big goddamn mistake. <laughs> Someone made a big goddamn mistake. Yeah, the, the, the Roman military was groundbreaking and, and just genius the way that they planned everything out the the tactics that they used you think they were the first ones to do those tactics like the the rotating shifts to keep everybody healthy oh, and, yeah. and not tired for sure and then having their 
the new guys talk shit to distract and then also use them to pull bodies. That's like fucking genius. If there were any other any other substantial militaries in in the area at the time using the same tactics, the Roman Empire wouldn't have spanned as much land as it did because they yeah. ended up taking up uh, makes taking sense. over like everything that touched the Mediterranean and then for hundreds of miles inland from the Mediterranean. So do you really do you think that it's like as simple as the rotating shift tactic and the distraction tactic in the in the checkerboard. It's a combination of everything because they they also spent a lot of time training. Like I said, they would go through about four months of of basic training. But did they train as hard as the Spartans? I mean, they took over all of Greece. Okay, so they did. Okay, so yeah, I don't think anybody could really stand up to the Roman Legion at the time. I mean, the the people who fared the best against the Roman Legion were still fighting the Skippy. Yeah, well, Scipio Africanus. Show. Well, Hannibal was was fucking up Rome for a while. Hannibal during so I think I mean. the second uh, second Punic War was with Hannibal. Uh, the The Carthaginians were pretty good at fucking up the Romans. Uh, Carthaginians, uh, is, who are they? Uh, they're from Carthage. It's on like the the northeast coast Carthage. of Africa. That, na- that name's super familiar to me. Uh, yeah, I mean it's just a, another part of Roman history in general. They were the ones mm-hmm. that. That gave the Romans a run for their money until Scipio oh. Africanus fucked him up at the Battle of Zama. I know why Carthage is familiar because the first fight in Gladiator, in the in the Colosseum, is the Battle of Carthage. Oh, yep. <laughs> okay, yeah. That's and right. And they're supposed to get slaughtered, but you know, Gladiator's so tough that he yeah, I'm pretty wins. I'm pretty sure that they were actually recreating the Battle of Zama there, which is where Scipio Africanus beat Hannibal. Okay, yeah. See, I know about this stuff. Me too. <laughs> oh shit! What do you say we call it a night? It's it's getting late. Okay. We, yeah, we should call it. Wait, but we didn't even get into the Maid Marian reforms. No, that's what we were we were talking about. But we're still pre reform. Yeah, yeah. The we just got to the end of the Triarii. Next in the next episode, we're going to be talking about the the Velites in more depth, and we're going to be talking about the Equites. And then we're going to be talking about the changes made by the Marian reforms that... The made Marian reforms by Caesar's uncle. By Caesar's uncle, Gaius Marius. He changed everything. Changed everything. And the changes that he made for sure paved the way for Caesar to become dictator for life because the changes that... And did Gaius, they slaughter more shit because of the reforms? Oh, yeah. The, the legion became much more effective after the Marian reforms because it increased the pool of recruits that they could they Uncle could bring Caesar, in. dude. Uncle and Caesar knew his shit. Changes from the Marian reform <laughs> made it so instead of the soldiers being loyal to the state, they were loyal to their general. And mm. Caesar was their general, so they were more loyal to Caesar than they were to the state of Rome itself. That makes sense. And that, that meant that, that, that Caesar could tell to them to do anything, and they would do it. They would actually follow him if he asked them to march on Rome. But that's something that we're going to get into in later episodes. That's fucking sweet. That's what fucking gladiators troops said that they would do for him but then he doesn't escape yeah because maximus decimus meridius really can't hold a candle to, to guy yeah, julius he, he caesar. died trying to do cool shit caesar lived forever it, well he maximus decimus meridius got all butthurt about his like one wife and one kid dying <laughs> that's so fucked up caesar lost a few wives they, i think only good, one of them died but remember when when he gets to, finally makes it home and he's crying and like it's like a but there's like a bunch of snot and stuff I remember it, it was it was emotional and I was all into it and he's like crying and there's like boogers everywhere and it made, it. I feel like that's that's sort of a actor's way of reaching for an Oscar is like okay I'm gonna do a crying scene but yeah, I'm I also know, gonna blow snot everywhere. But but Ridley was pretty crazy. He might have put snot on him for the scene because <laughs> he well he's a good director you know he was probably like dude. Russell, oh, if you Russell, can't, you're blowing if you it. can't build up the snot yourself, he just walks and over Russ- and blows a snot rocket on him. <laughs> and then was like, action. <laughs> Smeared it all over his face. He's like, now cry. <laughs> that's fucked up. All right, that's going to be it for this episode. Wait, uh, last thing. One last thing. Okay. Maid Marian. If we're doing the Maid Marian reforms, we need to at least mention her. Because... It was named after her, so well. It was made Marian. It was named after Gaius Marius. Which, which made Marian's the hottest? Robin Hood Men in Tights. No, it's definitely not the Kevin Costner one. 
It's the Disney, well, yeah, Disney she, one's the hottest. The Fox? Dude, she's so hot. And she's so nice. By far the hottest and the nicest. She's a fox. Oh, I don't mean that. Exactly. <laughs> I knew you were going to jump on that as soon as it came out of my mouth. <laughs> that's bestiality, Joel, and in most states, that's no. Illegal. But if I was a fox, I don't too, think that's illegal here in Texas, though. When you watch the movie, you love Robin Hood and married Marilyn, made Marion, and you wish you were a fox. When you're a kid, you know, I was like, "Fuck, I wish I was a fox." Jesus Christ, this is mermaids all over again. So you wouldn't, <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't fuck Maid Marion from the Disney movie. No, she's a fox. She doesn't have a cloaca. <laughs> she obviously doesn't have a cloaca. She's a mammal. She's a fox. Well, I mean, if you birds were a fox, and mammals also and they have cloacas. If I was a fox, would I fuck another fox? Well, I mean, if I was a fox, of course no, I would fuck another fox. If you were a fox, fox, would you be attracted to Maid Marian? I have. I, I mean, I would if, have to be. If you were a fox, which Maid Marian would, would you want to fuck the most? Robin Just Hood be- men in tights. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So you're, but that'd be besti- that would be bestiality for you. No, that, you're a fox. that's on her part. No, it goes both ways. She's the filthy degenerate any, fucking a fox, it, not me. Any, no, any, uh, any creature that fucks outside their species, that's bestiality. Well, no, I think that's just inner, inner species fucking. No, so that's, so we're good then. Do you remember when, do you remember when Maid Marion was watching Kevin Costner shower naked? Under in the waterfall. <laughs> come on, Matt. Remember that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this episode. We're gonna we're gonna come back in the next episode and we're gonna talk about the velites and the equites and get into the actual Marian reforms. And maybe, depending on how many times Joel interrupts me, <laughs> we might actually get back into the life of Caesar because right now we're still working on on setting the stage for everything. Did you not ever wonder why Kevin Costner had a had a tan line on his butt? Like, it was an underwear tan line when he was in the waterfall. I mean, he'd spent a bunch of time over in the Middle East during the Crusades, I'm assuming. He in got a, a little in, sun. In tidy whities He's not going to spend all of his time wearing leather armor. It's fucking hot <laughs> over there. Okay. I've thought about that much, at least. <laughs> thought about Kevin Costner and his underwear way more than I'd like to admit. If you like the podcast, like and subscribe to us on YouTube. We are on the Drinking Bros History channel. Um, if you want to support us even more, check out the other shows on the network. You can check out the Drinking Bros podcast. You can check out the American Party podcast, which stars Dan Holloway and Dakota Meyer, Medal of Honor recipient. You can check out our brothers on the History channel. Joel, get out of my goddamn camera. You can check out our... Our History Channel partners, Softcore History, which is a a great show. I've been sitting in on the recordings lately, and they do a really good job. They cover uh, some really interesting topics. I think the topic they did last night was the Kingdom of Punt, uh, which was a good one. Something I had never actually heard of before, but I had to to look it up when I I heard that they were going to be talking about it. Joel, I swear to God, if you block my camera one more time, I'm going to lose my fucking shit. The laptop's going to die. Oh, okay. All right, well, we better wrap this up quick. We would like to thank Rocom for our intro song. You can check him out at Rocom on Instagram. Also check out his line of toys, The Mighty Maniacs. Joel and I actually made a, a video game for it, so you could, yep. you could probably get a copy of that also if you send him a nice message. Yeah, if you follow Rocom on Instagram and ask him for a copy of the game, you got to give it to him, Ro, Rocom. Give it to him. If they ask, Rocom. just send it to him. Just, just give it to him. Uh, we would also like to promote the YouTube channel. We are now on YouTube, in case you aren't aware. So yeah, we're if you doing wanna, video now. If you want to hear our pretty face, or if you want to hear our our voices and see our pretty faces, check us out on YouTube, the Drinking Bros YouTube channel. Uh, also, if you want to help support the show, go and support the Drinking Bros yeah. Patreon. Donate to that, and you're going to get access to probably my my all time favorite new show, the Friday Night Jack Sesh. I was actually yeah, which a you guest were on. on the last yeah. episode. That was that's. Hands down, the most fun I've ever had with another man in bed, which is saying a lot. <laughs> I got to watch that episode. I, I still haven't watched it, but I, I want to watch it. Yeah, it was, it was so much fun. I really hope I get to do it again. And it's only on Patreon because it's too it's graphic a, for... It's a Patreon exclusive because it, it's much too graphic for, for yeah. YouTube. You can also follow us on Instagram if you want to check out what's going on with the podcast. Go to at, Insta- or at Instagram. That's how <laughs> fucking tired I am right now. <laughs> You're good. At Iconoblast Podcast. You can follow Joel at, at Joel R. Benner. And if you want to see me post a single photo every few weeks that is now all that good, 
at Coop Newcomb. Yeah. That's it. Icona Blast is the one to follow because, well, every episode we do, or at least every topic, every we're going gonna to burn something that, that burn uh, something new that relates to the to- yeah. topic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we still need something to burn for Caesar. That's it for this episode. We will be back next week where we continue the life and times of Julius Caesar. This has been the Icona Blast podcast. I am Matt Cooper. I'm Joel Benner. Reminding you to never take anything at face value.